Where do they go, those smoke rings I blow each night? I'm Johnny Weiser, and when I'm not serenading my co-host Oscar Hausman, I'm presenting Professionally Cannabis. Thank you for that, Johnny. Oscar, who are we interviewing today? Today we're interviewing Andrew Grieve. I say we, but it's just me this time. Tell me about Andrew. Andrew's the CEO of Xenobis Global. They're a pretty big deal, right? A real big deal. One of the largest LPs coming out of Canada. Right on. And Andrew himself is a very interesting character, a big financial background, military background as well. But listeners, you'll hear what I mean. Where do they go, the smoke rings I blow each night? Oh, what do they do, those circles of blue and white? Our guest today is Andrew Grieve, CEO of Xenobis Global. With a background in investment banking beginning his career at Macquarie Group before founding Agentis Capital Partners 10 years ago, he's risen to become the CEO of a Canadian licensed producer while at the same time maintaining a role as an officer in the Canadian Army. Welcome to the show, Andrew. Thank you very much for having me. So to kick us off and to give our guests more of an understanding about what brought you to the cannabis industry, how did you find yourself connected with this plant professionally? I found myself connected with Xenobis first through Bevo. The Bevo business formed Xenobis as a result of the amalgamation of Bevo and Sun Farm. It was owned by the Bene family. They're a Dutch family from the Fraser Valley in the lower mainland of British Columbia in Canada. And one of my business partners, Rob Van Bell, He's also Dutch. His family has had a 30-year relationship with the Bene family. When the Bene family and when Bevo were approached about potentially entering the cannabis business, they called Rob and we went and spoke to them about the opportunity and discussed the extent they were inclined to pursue entry into cannabis. So it sounds like you were led to the plant by the business opportunity. Could you talk to us about how you found your way into investment banking and what draws you to that lifestyle and how that compares perhaps to the cannabis profession and industry afterwards? Yes. When I was in university, I also had joined the Canadian Army and I was in the reserves and I completed courses in the summer. I completed my qualifications up to a certain level but I didn't actually have any commercial experience and I didn't actually have a plan. Essentially, I said that if I wasn't able to secure a great job, then I said I would go back to the army likely full time. Oh, wow. I actually only applied for a few jobs and one of them was at Macquarie in investment banking. At first, given you work 80 hours a week or 100 hours a week, I didn't like the work. But over the first eight months or so, I began to adjust to the hours and I came to love the pace and I came to love the challenge. As an individual who at the time was only 23, I was working on transactions that were hundreds of millions of dollars in value and then billions of dollars in value. And I was responsible for analysis. I was responsible for providing my commercial perspective. It was an amazing opportunity to work at the highest levels of business. Because how old were you when you started Agentis Capital then? You must have still been very young. I was 25. What happened is I left Macquarie and the first thing that I did with Agentis is I took over as the interim chief financial officer for a company called Green Meadows Foods. It was a distressed cheese manufacturing facility in Iowa. It was an incredibly large facility but it had been built during the credit crisis and the individual who had led that project, he actually didn't have sufficient capital at the time. He ran into the credit crisis and as a result, all lending dried up. And when I went to start working with the facility, we had tens of millions of dollars of unsecured creditors and we were losing money. And so I worked at the plant, secured additional capital and ran a sell side process and sold the plant despite it losing money and being incomplete, to Agripure, the largest Canadian cooperative. Was that the beginning of you going into being more of an operating entrepreneur rather than a financialist? It was the first thing where I actually spent time at a facility working with a management team 
and working on problems beyond simply building a model and projecting a forecast into the future. That was the first time I actually went in on the ground and worked with a management team on site for months on operational issues, on financing issues, and then also on selling the business simultaneously. So I think there's an interesting journey there because you've gone to now being the management team or the the representation of the pinnacle of it, our CEO. How big is the Zenibus team and how long did it take you to get the leadership capabilities? The Zenibus team is more than 650 people now. When our management circular came out for the amalgamation of Bevo and Sun Farm to create Zenibus, the team between Bevo and Sun Farm was less than 400 people. That was in November. We now have 650 people. So the ramp up has been amazing. From a leadership standpoint, in order to get to the point where I have the capacity to lead this team, that actually is a result of everything that I've done. And that includes my experience in the military. As a battery commander, for example, where I have a battery of four howitzers and two mortars and between 60 and 100 people are in a reserve battery. And therefore, I have extensive training in a wide variety of components of leadership from organizational design to decision making and uncertainty. All of these things are really important when it comes to leading and managing a business. Absolutely. And interesting, I would say, is the military background specifically, especially for an industry like cannabis, which has probably a reputation quite at odds with that. Do you think you're unique amongst cannabis CEOs with that military background? Do you think it gives you a unique advantage in the market? First, you mentioned that you think it it contrasts with how people perceive cannabis. Do you mean because of the product or because of the current state of the industry? Yes. I'd, so I'd say the current state of the industry is that many of the early pioneers come from more of, they're more likely to have been illicit operators than entrusted with armed troops, let's say. It's, it's a very different perspective. I agree with that. I think that it does provide a unique advantage. We're working very hard to professionalize, or not to professionalize our business, but to have a professional business from the outset. And our values are excellence, compliance, responsibility, and delivery of stakeholder value. Those values are really important to me. And those are values that I've brought over from the military. And those are values that I share with the rest of the management team. When one of your values is excellence and responsibility, a requirement of that is discipline. You need to have a team of people that are able to follow direction and complete things in a manner where their actions are consistent, where they follow direction and they really work to their utmost. And we have that team. There are a number of individuals from the military who are members of our management team. And I believe that we help in pushing that culture through the organization. But we also are able to build that culture quickly because we have an approach to hiring that's based on objective testing. And as a result, we're very likely to end up with individuals who their personality profile is consistent with those values. If I know that I have a team of people who all have very high conscientiousness scores, then I know that when I say we value excellence and things must be performed to the highest possible standard, that they're going to understand that vision and they're going to buy into those values. Interesting. And are you measuring conscientiousness with a perhaps objective psychometric test, something of that nature? Yes. So we have, we measure 13 attributes when we test people and we actually have a personality profile for each role within the organization. So we have a standard and we have a perspective on the type of person that should be in each role. A customer service representative needs to have low neuroticism because they can't have a really emotional response to a complaint. Someone who works in compliance needs to have a low agreeableness score because they can't bow to pressure from others within the organization. We've considered every single one of these 13 traits for each position that we have within the organization. It sounds very organized indeed. So let's talk a little bit about some of the results that the team's driven that you're most proud of. I think we've had a stack of press releases over the past couple months talking about things like the kombucha acquisition, uh, generating capital from 8Capital, and also something that I'm particularly interested in is 
a presence in Europe. I met some of your team at the inaugural lecture for the Centre for Medical Cannabis in London, and I know that you're sponsoring European Cannabis Week as well. So my question is, what will Xenobis be doing in Europe going forward? Xenobis has very ambitious plans for Europe, and the first component of that is having a facility in Malta from which we'll be able to ship to the rest of Europe. And in addition, having facilities in Canada that have met the standards required to ship to Europe. This is a very high priority for us. And one of the interesting things, having a high quality standard is a necessity for shipping to Europe, but we would fundamentally be pursuing these standards, even if there wasn't the requirement to meet these standards to ship to Europe. Our approach to business is consistent with EU GMP, even if it's not actually being framed in the EU GMP language. Our approach as a business is always consistent with the highest possible standards. So we intend to be shipping to Europe. We intend to be shipping through our facility in Malta, and we intend to be doing it as quickly as possible. That's great to hear. And I'd like to remain on the EU GMP point because it's one that comes up a lot. I think we've got about seven licensed producers who've reached EU GMP accreditation. What do you think is the hardest part about reaching that standard? That's an interesting question. I don't know what challenges others face. From our perspective, it's really simply going through the process. I wouldn't say that there's a challenge because EU GMP is consistent with our perspective and our approach. Our framework and our approach to the business, because it's consistent with the highest possible quality standards, and it's not something where we need to move to EU GMP and it's something different from what we would be doing anyways. It's simply ensuring that the process validation approach that we're taking is consistent with EU GMP and is tracked in a manner that allows us to meet that EU GMP certification. Well, I feel like that's slightly resemblant of when you ask in an interview what's your greatest weakness and someone replies that they care too much well i, but I, I actually will... <laughs> well i i don't so i don't like humble brags I, i'm not sure if you use the term humble brag I, I'm, I'm familiar with it i was going to say would you like to see that approach standardized within a canadian context as well that bar to be lifted from europe to the canadian and north american regulations i don't have a prescriptive perspective on that I think that's a question for regulators. We're going to meet the highest possible standard and we're going to constantly strive for improvement. So let's talk about some of that product and those excellence because I know you've got in the pipeline deals with a kombucha maker, you've got your craft grow brands, and you've also got a deal for CBD for Pharmaco. With all these products coming out, how do you maintain that excellence across them? And which of them are you most personally excited about? In order to maintain excellence, it's really about having a process. It's about ensuring that you know what it is you're trying to achieve and you have the steps required to achieve it. And then you're measuring whether or not you're taking those steps and then measuring the outcome. There are two things on this point. One, you manage what you measure. And then the second thing is that you get what you inspect, not what you expect. To the extent as a as a member of a management team, you simply provide direction, then one, you're not demonstrating sufficient interest in what your people are doing. Two, you don't actually know whether or not there are any shortfalls in terms of the approach. There's a reason why I'm here in Athelville on Good Friday. And the reason is because at currently our largest production center, at the moment, the hub of our business. I was here at the facility at 7.30 this morning and We started our walkthrough. We went through every single room and I had a sheet in front of me that looked at the plant count in each room, the strain in each room, the approach in each room. And it's interesting because I was talking to John Alexander, the facility manager here, and he said, I feel like we're doing better. And I said, it's not a feeling. It's not that you're just doing somewhat better. It's that the performance increase has been absolutely astounding for someone who doesn't see the facility constantly, it's easy for me to observe the amazing level of improvement. And not only is it worthwhile for me to inspect the facilities and ensure that our operations are consistent with our intent, but 
by performing those inspections, I can also provide feedback. It sounds like quite an emotional response, although I see you as a leader more driven by a very rational way of working. Again, added to that, there's a lot of social justice or equality things about Xenobis, such as working with First Nations people. How do you balance quite a hard-nosed logical operator with also doing what might be seen as um, sort of left-field, happy-clappy stuff? My perspective is that they actually work in harmony. So one of our values, as I said, is delivery of stakeholder value. And delivering value for shareholders requires delivering value for employees, requires delivering value for the communities in which we operate. If we didn't have the right employees and we didn't have the support of our communities, then we wouldn't be able to deliver shareholder value. From a rational standpoint, these things work together. They're mutually supportive rather than mutually exclusive. And that's a rational response. Then from an emotional standpoint, I'm really excited when I'm able to tell the people who work for me and the people who work with me that they've done a fantastic job. That is one of the best feelings. When I was talking to Kevin in Vancouver last week, he said, how am I doing? Are you happy? And I said, I have to be honest and tell you that given you're on time and on budget, I can't tell you that I'm just happy with your performance. I have to tell you that I'm ecstatic. <laughs> he said, that's really good to hear. As I said, yes, our approach is rational, but that doesn't mean that there isn't an emotional component to it. And instead of these things being mutually exclusive, I actually see them as being complementary. If people understand that you're passionate about what you're doing and they know that you're trying to make everything work properly, then if you have a high standard, when you tell them they've succeeded, it feels so much better than if someone has a low standard and says, oh yeah, things were fine. If the standard is incredibly high and you tell someone that they've been successful, the feeling should be one of elation rather than just a feeling of adequacy. That's, those are pretty some incredible words. Elation, fantastic, ecstatic. You probably have many drivers of those feelings in your work, providing medicines to patients, providing values to shareholders, or providing employee feedback. What, what makes you feel most fantastic? That is a very challenging question. The times when I feel great about what we're doing, one, when I come to the facility and I observe the improvement, I talk to our staff about the improvement. I tell them how I feel about their work. I feel great then. When I meet a customer who has had a fantastic experience with our product, I feel great about that. When I sat and had dinner with the chief of the Listigouche First Nation, and he and his wife said that the difference in dealing with Xenobis versus others was that we treated them with respect and as partners, and they expressed their gratitude for that, that felt amazing. And when I've spoken to the founders of the business who are key shareholders, and they look at what they're achieving and they say, we're confident in the plan and we recognize how we're going to deliver amazing value to our shareholders as well as to our remaining stakeholders. I feel fantastic about that. I don't know that which one of those feels the best, but I can tell you that those are things that feel really great. I can imagine. And they're, they're probably quite different. So I can see why you'd want to hang on to all three. So... We're on a show called Professionally Cannabis, and we actually haven't talked too much about the plant. So I was wondering if you could give our listeners perhaps a walkthrough of your product line and maybe what's exciting or anything in the pipeline that you might be able to tease or even release. I'm trying to think whether or not disclosing any additional strains is selective disclosure and therefore disclosure of material non-public information. I don't believe that it is. So what I will say is that I'm very happy with the fact that we have additional strains coming to market. Death Bubba, for example, Citrique. I was just looking at rows of Citrique plants. I'm very happy with the launch of our Blazery product line. I believe that having a brand that's focused on high THC product is important to us. And having a vision for that brand and having an approach to that brand strategy is important. I'm incredibly excited to have oil products coming out. Not as much oil droppers, but sublingual sprays and gel caps I am very excited about. And this is one of those situations where I really agree with the approach taken by Health Canada because 
gel caps and the sublingual sprays, you have a known controlled dose. And I think it's so important, whether you are a, an experienced user of cannabis or a new user of cannabis, that you have the ability to know the dose that you're taking and control the dose yourself. I think that's a far superior product to the oil dropper product. And so I actually agree with Health Canada's approach of removing the oil dropper product in the future and instead having all products that have a known controlled dose. So would that be, for instance, a known dose via a spray? Correct. Yes, a sublingual spray where the dose of each spray is known and disclosed. So one of the products I mentioned earlier and one that I wanted to talk about just because I think it's a really interesting trend is your company's acquisition of Hillsborough, the producers of kombucha. Now, kombucha for our listeners in Europe, where it's slightly less popular, is a fermented tea drink. How do you see that marrying with cannabis? And is there a sort of wellness overlap where you see a consumer demand that wants both cannabis and wellness in the form of fermented teas? Absolutely. We believe that there are a lot of cannabis consumers in Canada and elsewhere who are health and wellness focused individuals, and in particular, natural health and wellness focused individuals. Therefore, we believe that these are actually fantastic products to put together. But when we acquired that business, there was value beyond simply the THC and CBD component of the business. That was a business that already had strong revenue, already had strong earnings, but was a regional distributor of their product. They only distributed in Alberta. Fantastic tasting product consistent with natural health and wellness, a product that we believe people will want to have infused with cannabis. We were also able to take that product and achieve national distribution essentially immediately. And because it's a great tasting product, we don't believe we simply own a great product that we can add THC and CBD to. We simply own a great product with a fantastic management team. And we look forward to having a bottling line in one of our licensed facilities where we're adding THC and CBD to our kombucha product. Great. And so you mentioned there that it was the management team that drew you. When you're looking to make acquisitions, and let's imagine that there's one on the table now, how do you do your due diligence? What do you look for in the team, in the business plan, and in the market? It's interesting because one of the things that occurred when I first took on this role is People asked whether or not it would be worthwhile, given the number of opportunities we see from an M&A standpoint, to have a spreadsheet that indicated all the things that matter to us and to move to a numerical objective approach. And it's interesting because I talked about how we generally take a systematic approach to everything. But in this case, I said no. And the reason I said no is because as soon as you do that from an M&A standpoint, you limit the approach you're taking to a business. And rather than looking at every single business from a first principle standpoint, you're trying to fit the business characteristics into these predefined attributes. If you look at a business holistically, you can't fit everything into these predefined attributes. And so there could be a business where the management team isn't the management team we want, but the technology is exactly what we want. Or There could be a business where what we really want is it's more like an aqua hire where we're acquiring a team and we're bringing a team on with the right incentivization to work with us because those are the people we need. If you move to a systematic approach to M&A where you always have the same criteria and the same attributes, then you miss the ability to use that first principles approach. And so this is one of the very few cases where I rejected a systematic approach and said, you must do this using first principles every single time. Interesting. And so what, what, what are those first principles? Well, I would say that first principles is not a list of principles. First principles is looking at a situation and examining it without any preconceived notion of what we want to achieve. When you look at an M&A opportunity, the first question then is, well, what truly is the opportunity? And then it's, does this fit into what we're trying to achieve? And then you can move on and say, well, how could I make this fit in? How could I make this work? How would this impact my broader strategy? But you have to start every conversation that far back in terms of the thought process, because 
the range of opportunities in this industry at the moment, they're so diverse that you can't look at any of those opportunities and know beforehand what you could potentially derive from them. There is no way to have a grid of what matters and have that apply to every company. So you were working with Zenabis before becoming CEO from about a year ago, I believe. What would you wish you'd known when you'd started out that would have changed the course or maybe accelerated things? I was not working with Zenibus a year ago. I was advising Bevo. And at that time, we concluded that Sun Farm was the right partner for us. The list of things that I would have loved to have known is endless. Hindsight is twenty twenty, but hindsight also generally isn't valuable because when you evaluate a decision you made, it's not about whether or not that decision produced the outcome you wanted. It's about whether or not that decision was appropriate and valid given the information you had at the time. Those are very different ways of looking at things. There are many decisions that I've made over time where I didn't actually achieve the intended outcome, but that doesn't mean it was the wrong decision because it was the right decision based on the information that I had at the time. The list of things that I wish I would have known is endless, but The real question for me is, with the information I had, should I have pursued more information before making a decision, or should I have made a decision based on the information that I had? So has your decision-making process not changed within that year? My decision-making process has potentially evolved slightly, but the decision-making process that I have has been built over years of experience in decision-making and uncertainty and evaluating risk and reward. The military involves decision-making and uncertainty. Army Staff College is about teaching you decision-making and uncertainty, looking at principles of risk and reward. Investment banking is about decision-making and uncertainty. And running a business in a competitive environment is about decision-making and uncertainty. And so I've developed an approach to decision-making and uncertainty over time, an approach to risk management, and an approach to evaluating risk and reward That approach I modify from time to time based on new information because I'm always updating. And I don't believe that the approach is ever firm and finalized, but I haven't made significant changes in the approach. For example, our strong preference or my strong preference is to value certainty, is to value a reduction in risk. And in many cases, the best opportunities in life are those with controlled downside and exceptional upside. It's almost impossible to find opportunities with no risk and exceptional upside. The opportunities to avoid are those with symmetrical downside and upside. If someone says that my risk of loss is equivalent to my potential gain, I don't want to pursue that opportunity. It's not worthwhile. You need to find opportunities with asymmetric risk and reward. And when we looked at this opportunity, that's exactly what we had found, an opportunity with asymmetric risk and reward. We know that we have the right team, the right assets to achieve success. So the approach that we took in putting these two businesses together to create Zenibus is consistent with that concept. So on the asymmetric risk point, have you not increased your own risk by not taking a salary and relying on the company being successful in 2021? Or is that for you not a risk at all? The question is, what have I foregone? And what's the value of that to me? From my perspective, I wouldn't value the incremental salary that I could have received. It is not meaningful to me as an individual. The firm that I previously ran, where I'm still a partner, but not an operating partner, we invested close to $5 million of our own funds in this deal. I'm not in a position where a salary will change my life, but I am in a position where to the extent I've built alignment with shareholders, that's better for shareholders. And it demonstrates to them my confidence in success. But I also believe that that's appropriate when it comes to my responsibility. Responsibility is one of our values, and there's no better way to demonstrate that value than to say, I believe that I only deserve a reward to the extent we achieve success using objective measures. And therefore, if I can achieve superior alignment and communicate my confidence and communicate the value of responsibility to people by not having a salary, I actually think that produces a better risk reward outcome. Because the the risk for me of the foregone salary is actually no risk. Well, I, 
That's a that's a very interesting answer. I like the way you take everything that could be seen possibly as being kind and revert it into a rational decision rather than let it be led by your generosity. But I'll, I'll take that as your character. I think we've got time for one more question. So I'd quite like to know, do you have any contrarian views in the industry? Do you think something that perhaps most other people would disagree with? One thing that may be a contrarian perspective, perhaps relative to what some believe, is what will happen with regards to consolidation and scale. I believe that our provincial counterparties will move to have fewer and fewer suppliers. And therefore, when I look out at the landscape of a significant number of licensed producers, I don't actually see that significant number of licensed producers selling to the provincial authorities. And as a result, I see malinvestment in companies that cannot achieve necessary economies of scale. Therefore, when I looked at this opportunity, I said, we must achieve scale. There's not an option whereby we build a modest business. There's no purpose of building a modest business in this industry, because whether you build a very ambitious business or a modest business, there are a lot of things you still need. And in order to have long-term relationships with provincial counterparties, my perspective is that we also need to have a certain scale. So I simply don't see there being a long-term opportunity for the smallest participants in this industry unless they have a certain specialized approach. Very interesting. I think that's a nice line to leave our viewers with, that ambition is going to be what drives this industry forward. Thank you very much for appearing on our podcast, Andrew. Thank you very much. It was absolutely fantastic. And I'm very appreciative of the fact that you were willing to take the time to speak to me. Where do they go? The smoke rings I blow each night. Oh, what do they do? Those circles of blue and white. Well, listeners, if you enjoyed my serenading at the top of the episode, please like. If you found the interview interesting, please subscribe. And if you want Oscar to serenade me on a future episode of Professionally Cannabis, please share with everybody you know.